This is Bishop O'Connell coming to you from the Chancery of the Diocese of Trenton. During the past spring, at one of our Presbyteral Council meetings, we had a presentation, a very good presentation, on the financial state of the diocese as well as uh, the planning prospects going forward, going into the future. And as I listened to that presentation at the Presbyteral Council, I thought this would be a very good thing to share with the pastoral councils and the finance councils of the parishes throughout the diocese. And so with me today is Mr. Anthony Mingarino, who is the Chancellor of the Diocese, as well as our Chief Administrative Officer and Chief Financial Officer, and also Mrs. Terry Ginther, who is the Director of Pastoral Life and Planning in the Diocese. Welcome. It's good to have you both. Thank, Thank you. you, Bishop. You know, to run any kind of organization or operation, it takes two things. <laughs> along with the grace of God. Uh, one is money, and the other is good planning. Yes. And so both of you have been intimately involved in those processes, uh, and perhaps you could give a little report uh, that would kind of capsulize for uh, those who are viewing this presentation today. Give them some sense of the state of the finances of the diocese, and also what we can look forward to as we move forward. Thank you, Bishop. I would like to talk about three things today, actually. Um, chancery operations, uh, parish finances, and the impact of Hurricane Sandy on the parishes. Uh, and there was a significant impact. Here at the chancery, uh, our diocesan revenue has remained static in the last five years, r roughly around $17 million. The source of this revenue is, are the assessments, uh, and interest on the investments, and the proceeds from the annual Catholic Appeal. Maybe you could just mention, what, what is a, an assessment? What does that mean? An, an assessment is a tax that the diocese places on, on parishes uh, to help fund the operations which you have deemed necessary, or the ministries which you have... The priorities. Uh, the priorities and the ministries which you have deemed necessary for the diocese. Uh, the parishes are all taxed at the same rate of, of, of 10%, and there's, and there's a formula that's involved. Um, the, the assessment is, uh, is pretty much throughout the Catholic Church and throughout the United States. Every, every diocese assesses their parishes, much the same as the New Jersey Catholic Conference assesses the diocese, the uh, U.S. Conference assesses the diocese, okay. and the Vatican assesses the diocese. So that's just part of our, our, our financial heritage. Um, so our, our finances have, our revenue has remained around $17 million for the last five years. Unfortunately, the expenses have not been uh, static over the last five years. The expenses have increased an average of 2.1% per year. Uh, that's roughly um, $1.5 million over the past five years. So keep in mind, though, during that same period that the average inflation was 1.6%. So we had a 2.1% average increase against a 1.6% uh, rate of inflation. Our increases were really 0.5%. I mentioned to you that our expenses did not decrease and continue to increase. So the medical benefits, as an example, we all know the cost of, of medical benefits. Uh, we've done a great job in controlling that cost, and I think we're well under industry standards with a 4% increase average over the last five years. Yeah, that's, that's one of those items that we know is never going to go in the other direction. It's never gone in the other directions, and really the, the standard out there is well over 10%. So I think we've done, we've done very well in that regard. Um, we've tried to control expenses, and for the salary increases for our employees over the past five years, salary increases averaged 1.9%. There were actually two years where our employees did not get salary increases. Staffing levels over the last five years have decreased, and really I would rather talk in terms of 10 years, I think. And uh, two, since 2004, the number of positions have decreased by 27. In the last three years, since, since you've been here, uh, the number of positions have decreased 11. It's, it's a total of 27 in the last 10 years. So uh, we've, uh, as things were increases, increasing throughout the diocese and throughout the chancery, we have made every effort to decrease where we can. Some of the challenges that we have are not going to go away either. Um, 
we have parishes that are struggling, and we average about $1 million each year of unpaid assessments to the diocese. So that's something that we have to absorb here. The support for the seminary has increased um, by 41% uh, since 2009. That's a good thing. That's an expense that we yeah, like we're to have. We're increasing the number of seminarians. The number of seminarians is increasing. Uh, and we are getting younger seminarians, and therefore that we have college uh, expense to pay for. So that has increased 41%. And we have to take care of our retired priests. The number of retired priests are going up over the next few years pr pretty significantly. Uh, in the last five years, our support of the retired priests has, has doubled. And I think Terry is going to speak a little bit about this yes, numbers. Sure. The numbers yeah. sure. When, when parishes are uh, in financial straits, they come to the diocese. Uh, sometimes there's a heater that they need. It's, and it's, it's never a luxury. It's my heater is broken, my roof is leaking. Uh, we average $376,000 a year in subsidizing parishes who can't meet their own expenses. The last two years, it was $550,000 each of those years. Same thing with schools. We have schools that are struggling uh, and we have subsidized them as well to the tune of about $500,000 per year. So these are expenses that we can't always anticipate, but they are there. I want to talk a little bit now about um, the parishes. And, uh, and, and it's interrelated because what affects the parishes affects the diocese. And so our, our future are tied very tightly together. Uh, we, at the time that the report was done, it was as of fiscal year, uh, 2013. We don't have the 2014 financials consolidated yet. At the time there were 109 parishes. Of the 109 parishes, 36 percent have a debt to the diocese. And by debt to the diocese, I mean unpaid premiums for health care, lay pensions, and then insurance. How much would that be in total? Do you have a sense of that? I will, I will get You're to that in about a minute, I think. Um, 62 percent of the of the parishes uh, have collections with which have decreased an average of one percent over the last five years 39 percent of our parishes operated at a deficit that's 43 parishes operated at a deficit for the last three years 21 percent of our parishes six percent of our parishes had deficit for two years in a row and 13 percent had deficits uh, for one year now you're t um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the accounts receivable. So th these are the premiums that we, the diocese, pay on behalf of the parishes, and then we bill the parishes for this. This includes life insurance for a uh, lay and priest, medical insurance uh, for the clergy, medical insurance for lay, property and casualty insurance, and assessments. The, uh, the balance due going back to the year 2000 to the diocese is $37 million. 36% of the parishes have a significant debt to the, to the diocese. As an, as an example, um, the debt to the diocese for medical benefits is $8 million. This goes back. So we, the diocese, paid that on behalf of the, of the parishes, and the, and the parishes are not paying us for a variety of reasons. Collections uh, over the last, I'm going back to 2006 with collections. The collection. Course, see, the, the thing to remember, the, these, are, these are not optional items. These are these not are optional. These are things that we have to right. provide for, and if a parish can't provide for it, we have to turn to the, to the diocesan office to provide right. it. Uh, the collections since uh, 2006 have, have decreased, and I think any pastor will attest to the fact that, uh, that this is a, a true statement. Collections have, attendance has gone down, and so have, have the collections. We had one year in 2011 where we had an increased offertory campaign, and collections went up 10% for the following year, but it, it wasn't sustained. Uh, the collections increased 9.5% over a seven year period. That was, so that's an increase of 1.35% uh, of a year, but that's with the high of 10% for one of those years. You take that out, and we had a decrease over that period. So, so the parishes are suffering, and as I mentioned, the diocese is very closely re connected to the parishes. As far well, as in many ways, I mean, the, the parish is where the diocese lives that, and breathes. Right. And uh, you know, sometimes there's a dichotomy presented. Well, that's the 
diocese and they think, oh, well, that's the chancery office, and then there's the rest of reality. Right. And in reality, the situation is the diocese is the parishes. That's right. I agree. That's, so that's the reality of, of the situation that, we've, that we see. We have, we have financial issues here that we're dealing with. We've made every effort to control expenses here. We've reduced staff here significantly, but, and there are challenges going forward because of the, um, the expenses that are associated with uh, premiums, insurance premiums, and the expenses that um, our own parishes can't sustain for themselves. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about um, the effects of, of uh, Hurricane Sandy. It'll be two years at the end of October where we, uh, Hurricane Sandy devastated the Jersey Shore significantly in, in, some, in central New Jersey. Uh, we were very fortunate to have significant insurance in place so that not one dollar has been spent by the diocese. Insurance has covered it all. But aside from the insurance issue, which I'll talk about in a second, we had 22 parishes that had significant devastation from the hurricane. So not only was there an insurance issue of repairing their premises and restoring the facilities, but the people were devastated. And when the people were devastated, we pray that they continue to go to church somewhere, but the collections in those parishes went down significantly. The, uh, in, uh, from one year to the next, they went down almost a million dollars from 2012 to 2013. That was the full year effect of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, in the half a year, it went down about a half a million dollars. So there was a de definite effect on the parishes. Whether it's going to be sustained through 2014 when we get the financials, we'll, we'll, know, it. we'll know at that point. But uh, the parishes have done a great job in uh, continuing to minister to, the, to their people in spite of the fact that the, the income was significantly reduced. I'm going to talk a little bit about insurance because insurance impacts much of what we talked about as far as expenses are concerned in the parishes and here at the diocese. The, um, we, we had in place at the time of the hurricane $10 million in flood insurance. Uh, the prem and we had wind insurance, $75 million. Uh, we had a, de a deductible of $1 million. Our premium was $800,000. After the hurricane, the, um, we took out $18 million in insurance. We kept the wind and fire as it was. Our premium is $2.3 million. So that's a significant increase, three times what we were paying. We have to pass this, we have to bill our parishes for this. And so that's an increase that we, that we all will be sharing as a result of that hurricane. But as far as the hurricane goes and, and the insurance that we had, we had um, a $1 million deductible, which we did not pay out of pocket because we had uh, a grant for the, from the USCCB, which you were very instrumental and having directed to our diocese. Uh, we, we, we had separate insurance on some of our sites, which also covered the, the, the deductible. So the out of the pocket to the diocese was zero. Huh. The cost to the parishes for any repairs they made was zero. So I think we did well from the insurance perspective. Unfortunately, going forward, the insurance company are gonna want the increase in premium, and that will be $2.3 million. I might, I might also add that the $10 million that we got just for flood insurance from the insurance company well exceeds what we've ever paid for them in insurance premiums. So they lost out on our deal, uh, but, and now they intend to make up for it uh, with increased premium. Uh, so that's, that's the state of uh, the finances of the, of the Chancery, a little bit of an overview of the parishes and some of the struggles and challenges that we both face and, and an update on uh, the impact of, of Hurricane Sandy. Well, Tony, I appreciate very much your presentation, and uh, thank you. You do a great job of overseeing the resources of the diocese and managers, managing them, so I appreciate that very much. And uh, as you can see, the reality is, uh, is uh, a bit sobering, and, but it's one we have to take hold of and embrace uh, and try to make better in any way that we can. So I appreciate very much uh, your comments and sure. your presentation. Again, the financial support, the resources of the diocese are essential. What are the essential for? Our business is the transmission and the strengthening of faith throughout the four counties. 
uh, Mercer, Burlington, Ocean, and Monmouth County. And that's why we're here. That's what we do. Uh, and in order to do that and do that well, we have to be able to have the kind of resources necessary to back up the things that we do as a diocese, the things that we do within our parishes. Uh, but the diocese is not static. We're looking forward to the future, to new challenges and new ways of responding to those challenges. And part of that certainly uh, is doing a good job in anticipating and planning as best we can for the future. So Terry Ginther is going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the studies and the works that she has done in gearing us and moving us in that direction. Thank you, Bishop. You know, when we uh, talk about planning, we always, have to, we always have to start from a realistic look of where we are today. Uh, and so I'd like to spend uh, a few minutes just talking about where we uh, live sort of currently in terms of our statistics as a diocese. Uh, but in each one, we can see what the trend is. We can see what it is we should be turning our attention to. Uh, and so they help us to name the challenges and then to plan accordingly. Uh, as you said, the, the primary experience of church for most Catholics is the parish. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about the status of the pastoral mission of the church, we have to first turn to the parish and uh, think about uh, what, what it is, uh, how do we describe the parishes? What is the circumstances in those parishes of the diocese? Right now there are 107 parishes uh, in the diocese of Trenton. They range in size from 7,800 families down in Barnegat and Manahawkin to 102 families, our smallest Korean parish here in the, in the city of Trenton. The average parish is about 2,400 families, mm. about the size of St. Rose and Belmar, perhaps. Uh, and if we wa we're looking for the midpoint, how many parishes are, are half the parishes being larger, half the parishes being smaller, uh, that would be at 2,086 families. Holy Cross in Rumson is right in the center uh, of our distribution. So you can see and imagine that what might be the case in a 7,800 family parish versus a 102 family parish would be very different indeed. Uh, the number of Catholics then, when we look at those households, we put it somewhere between 830 and 850,000 Catholics uh, in these four counties of the Diocese of Trenton. And that has uh, grown in our lifetimes. Um, we, we've become used to that growing because of the migration of people from northern New Jersey, the retirees who have populated all of our uh, over 55 developments, through, particularly in Monmouth and Ocean County. Um, but we can see from the trend analysis that is slowing. So that growth that we've become so used to just be up by people moving into the counties will no longer be the case. Mm. Our growth will come from evangelization. We can look at the participation of people in the life of the parish, first of all with mass attendance. Uh, each year we take account in October, which is ordinary time. It's not the strong seasons. Uh, we get a good sense of how many people are coming to Mass on a weekly basis. And that's self-reported from each that's parish? That's self-reported, yes, and actually head counted um, in each parish over several weeks in October. So there'll be a new one coming up this year soon. Uh, that tells us that on an average Sunday in ordinary time, about 144,000 Catholics are attending Mass in the diocese. When we look at that, it sounds like a very big number, but when you spread it among 107 parishes and 850,000 Catholics, we can see that less than 20% of Catholics are attending Mass weekly. Now many, many more attend Mass on a less than weekly rotation, maybe once a month, or perhaps even only for holidays, uh, and they are affiliated with parishes in some way. But it's concerning uh, for us, and it certainly changes our, uh, the level of involvement at parishes when only 20% of Catholics are worshiping with the community on a regular basis. And the national average is about the same, right? right? Yes, it is. It's right about the same. Uh, uh, we can even see it uh, among our mainline Protestant denominations uh, that they are also experiencing that kind of fall off in regular worship. Um, and and uh, 
it's a special challenge. I yeah, think. so the issue is it's got to be something broad. It's broader than the Catholic Church. I mean, people are quick to point out the sex abuse crisis or a number of things, uh, but it's, it's something deeper and it's something more pervasive. Sure. So it goes beyond the Catholic Church. Oh, I think so. Um, but as uh, someone who, who thinks and prays a lot about our mission, it's very hard for us to, um, I think, animate uh, the, the Catholic faithful in mission in the world if they're not um, tied to the sacrament. The Eucharist is mm -hmm. the center of our, of our faith life. Uh, and for uh, those Catholics who perhaps have distanced themselves or, or have um, adopted a less frequent reception of, uh, of the Eucharist, uh, the, in, the, um, the likelihood that they drift away in their faith uh, be, becomes much higher. Uh, St. John Paul II said, without the Eucharist, there is no church. That's right. So that's one of the, uh, the numbers that we watch very closely. Uh, the other number I look for is uh, whether the laity are being included in leadership decisions. And so I look at the number of finance councils around the diocese. Almost every parish in the diocese has a finance council. Yeah, I think we only have one that doesn't. That's right. And, and that's probably because it's a very small parish the arrangement is a little bit different there. Uh, certainly there's advice being given. Uh, but to, uh, the good news is that two of every three parishes are reporting that they have some form of a pastoral council. So a group of laity that are involved and, um, and assisting the pastor with looking toward the future of mission for the parish. So that number has grown uh, over the last 10 years. Do you get any feedback from the membership of the these pastoral councils, because that is exciting and that is good news about their feeling of ownership of the parish and ownership of its direction. Is it positive? Oh, sure, it's positive. And, you know, we, um, we believe very strongly as Catholics that God places all the gifts necessary in a community for the community to thrive and to attain its mission. And the pastoral council is one of the ways that uh, we see that in action. We, we uh, bring together people of all different experiences, so, you know, married folks and non-married folks, people from different ethnic backgrounds, people from the business world, teachers, uh, pa people who are parents, the, the, the more veteran among us, shall we say, and the younger, sure. uh, and, and when we can come together and talk about what the uh, importance of our parishes are, what the mission of our parishes are, uh, certainly that sense of ownership um, grows, and the way that pastoral councils help pastors to engage the rest of the community is especially important, I think. Mm. Uh, we, uh, we do have to, to acknowledge the stresses that change places upon our parishes. And just like we are experiencing change in our school systems and change in our uh, municipal uh, towns and, and even within our country, we have experienced change within our parishes. And one of the numbers that I've been following uh, with some interest is the number of pastor changes that we've had. And so if we just look at the last five years alone, more than half of our parishes have experienced a pastor change. And that's a significant stress within a parish. It absolutely is. Believe me, it's a stress for the bishop too. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. When we spread that out to seven years, more than three quarters of our parish parishes have experienced a pastor change. And so just like any organization, when the leadership style changes, when perhaps the worship style changes, um, it's like a, it's a family. It's a web mm. of relationships that have to get rebuilt over and over again. It takes a great deal of attention. It means sort of stopping where you are in place to attend to those relationships, uh, putting other things aside for a little while. And so there's been significant stress unavoidable though it is, uh, significant stress on our parish is caused yeah, pa by that. Pastors are not changed arbitrarily. That's right. You know, a lot of thought and planning goes into making that decisions. And I, I feel it very keenly myself. Um, sometimes it's just a uh, pastor's been in a place for so long and it's kind of burnt out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the pastor himself will ask for a change, but of course, you're not gonna communicate that to the parish that you've asked to. Sure. You've asked to leave the family. Uh, but they, they know themselves, they know their needs and their, their own limits. It's sometimes that a person has been successful in one parish in an area that another parish could really benefit from. They've done the work here, 
now to move them to another place where they could do the same strengthens. And so uh, I think people think that, that we just uh, sit down with a list and flip a coin or just throw the dart and that's where they land. And that's, that's not the case. We work very hard to measure uh, the man with the parish, right. uh, hoping that it's going to be a success and hoping it strengthens uh, what goes on in the parish. And it almost always is successful. Mm -hmm. It isn't always successful, but it almost always is successful. And each of our pastors bring a different set of gifts and, it. and it can help the parish grow in another dimension of its life. Uh, so that's definitely one of the special challenges of diocesan planning to be looking at the diocese as a whole and not at, as each parish as some church unto itself. Right. Um, right. So the other area where change has been evident uh, in the last many years is in the consolidation of parishes. And since 2005, we've moved from 127 parishes now to 107. So we have 20 less parishes uh, in the diocese. And over how long has passed? Over, over um, uh, eight years, eight years, since eight 2005, years. Yeah. right? That's eight years, yes. <laughs> and we're, we're a lot more uh, uh, slow moving on in this respect than some of our neighboring dioceses, which have large numbers of parishes that are consolidated. That's right. But you know, we, we can't be foolish to think that's what's happening everywhere in the church is not gonna happen within Trenton. And we've gotta move forward with the idea that, that the resources are pooled, especially the human resources, the personnel resources, and shared. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that near the end of my remarks. Um, we have to think about facilities, and many of our parishes are over 100 years old, and the facilities are aging. There are costs associated with the maintenance of those facilities. Uh, in many cases, uh, there are, I think, 571 masses celebrated on a Sunday wow. uh, in, in uh, the Diocese of Trenton some 125 churches and parish halls where Sunday Mass is said. That's 84,000 seats that are available uh, at one Mass time uh, in, in the diocese. So you can see it's not a question of space, but the space isn't always in the right place. Yeah. Uh, and so we have six or seven parishes where on a regular basis their Mass attendance uh, goes way beyond their ability, their capacity to uh, to seat people uh, and to help, help people be comfortable. And so that's uh, one, of the, one of the things we have to be looking at. Where has the population moved? There's been a drift of the population from the uh, Trenton area, the Mercer, Mercer uh, particularly the city of Trenton, out into the suburbs. And so you see larger communities out there. And there's even within that number, changes and shifts in demographics. Absolutely. That people didn't anticipate. That's right. That's right. So those consolidations uh, uh, have been effect ha have helped us to make some decisions about facilities, but there are still some places uh, where we're feeling the strain of not having facilities that are adequate yeah. for the size of the congregation. And so, as we plan for the future, we have to be thinking about that. Uh, there are um, territorial parishes in the diocese. Most of our parishes have uh, an assigned geography to them. And that's canon law. I that's, mean, that's right. That's been the practice. About 101 of them. But that, that leaves us six, um, six personal parishes, parishes that are uh, established specifically to uh, minister to a particular population, usually a cultural group, an ethnic group. Uh, and over time, the number of personal parishes in the diocese has diminished. Uh, and we see that the church really isn't using that as one of its, um, one of its uh, approaches for ministering to ethnic populations. Uh, and uh, as those ethnic, ethnic populations become integrated into the wider community, the need and their ability to sustain personal parishes is quite compromised. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's something that we need to look at. You know, in the diocese, we celebrate Mass in 10 different languages, wow. 10 different vernacular languages, as well as in the Latin extraordinary form. Uh, and our largest and most quickly growing um, ethnic or cultural group are those who speak Spanish, the Latino population of the Diocese of Trenton. Mm. Uh, the most recent CARA report tells us that there are some 112,000 Catholics of Latino heritage in the Diocese of Trenton. 
Um, that's a huge number. That's about 13 percent um, of it's our about total 13%, population. That's right, and that's that's uh, jumped from about 8 percent in only five years' time. Uh, we can sort of look at that trend nationally and see that coming down the road. We know that the migration uh, of Latinos to the United States, 20 million in 20 years, mm -hmm. between 1980 and 2000. If you juxtapose that to the earlier migration that my European ancestors came in that 150 years around the turn of the century, 1900 to the middle of that century, you know, that was probably 20 million over 150 years <laughs> instead of 20 million over 20 years. Yeah. And so while that European migration changed the face of the United States church, uh, the Latino migration is now changing the face of the U.S. church. We um, have some statistics from the uh, n national demographics that tell us that something around 40 percent of U.S. Catholics are Hispanic. More than 50 percent, 52 percent I believe, um, of Catholics under 30 are Hispanic. Um, and more than 60 percent of Catholics under the age of 18 are Hispanic. Uh, and so it's an... It's that's, a, that's the future. That's right. It's, a, it's an important trend that we need to be paying attention to. We're seeing the lead edge of it here in the Diocese of Trenton. Many other dioceses along the southern tier of the United States have experienced this uh, in a much more forceful way, but make no mistake, our, our um, population will continue to grow in this area as well. These, these numbers of, of young people, you know, I received a report from uh, the Committee on Hispanic Ministry yes. yesterday, and they indicated there that these young people are not going to Catholic schools. That's right. So if we're going to reach them with the faith and with all that we hope to offer them, and keep them in the Catholic Church, we've got to develop other ways of evangelizing Hispanic Catholics. Absolutely, absolutely. And we know, um, you know, after living in this uh, multicultural, intercultural uh, situation here in the United States, that language is only the tip of the iceberg. That the way people think, that their thought processes, that uh, the way faith is um, enculturated into the culture of a person, um, that that, it, it, that that varies from community to community. And so we have to become, I think, more proficient uh, at ministry in an intercultural setting. Um, yeah. we, uh, we, we follow the trends in uh, marriage and family life. You know that um, family life really is the basic building block of the church. Uh, but and it's a, part of the conversation right now. Absolutely. Worldwide. Absolutely. Uh, but we can see here in the Diocese of Trenton that the number of marriages celebrated by diocesan parishes has dropped more than 50% in, in just since the year 2000, wow. just since the millennial year. And I remember us being so full of hope and, and so, um, so uh, full of zeal for evangelization, but somehow we've not been successful at, um, at countering the sort of cultural argument that marriage is anything you want it to be. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I, I'm encouraged that, you know, going forward, marriage is going to be one of our pastoral priorities here in the diocese. I know you're expecting some, some recommendations from a, a commission that's yeah. been studying the question. And, you um, know, this, this topic has come up in the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops as yes. well as part of its priority. Now we do see that people are marrying a little bit later. We do see an uptick in um, parishes and their attention to convalidation, people who uh, marry civilly and then come to the church to have their marriage blessed later. But that's a special area that needs attention here. There's a great uh, opportunity for the church yeah. uh, if, we, if we can uh, mobilize in that area. Um, we also see a drop in birth rates, Bishop, and uh, when we look at the falling numbers, um, some of that is because the population uh, uh, is not replacing itself, if mm -hmm. you will. 
Uh, and so uh, our baptism numbers are down about 30% as well. About 7,500 people are baptized, are brought into the faith in the Diocese of Trenton. That's wonderful news. Um, and, but one of the things that we're noticing is while in previous generations, while about 95% of them would, in, would have been infants at the time of their baptism, that number is uh, slowly decreasing. And now that number stands around 88%. So that means 12% of our baptisms uh, are, are uh, being celebrated with people who are over the age of seven, children over the age of seven, or up into adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's a, it's a change in our pattern of evangelization uh, that we have to be ready to, um, to address uh, really at the, parish, at the parish level. Yeah, the burden there is gonna be on the religious education programs and the parishes because many of these youngsters are not going to Catholic schools. So. That's right, that's right. Now um, we also see that uh, in that baptism issue of the 10 uh, of the parishes, the, ten, the parishes with the 10 highest number of baptisms in a calendar year, uh, I think seven of them have growing Latino communities. Yeah. And so it sort of validates our viewing of that Hispanic trend coming along. One parish um, that had the uh, largest number of baptisms, I think 341. 341, that's right. Is a Hispanic parish. That's right, St. Anthony Claret in Lakewood. In Lakewood. Um, and, and that's really interesting because by size, by number of families, uh, that's among the 20% the smallest parishes. So it's telling you just how young the, yeah. the uh, parishioners are yeah. there. Um, we do watch the two ends of the spectrum so that we can see uh, in parishes whether we're meeting the needs of all the people. And so we watch that ratio of baptisms to funerals. In the diocese, it's about 1.2 baptisms to one funeral, um, which sh still shows a healthy sort of growth rate. But we have a number of parishes where there are more funerals than baptisms. And the ones that concern me are the parishes where there are twice as many funerals as baptisms. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's important that the, that the church is um, ministering to uh, folks nearing the end of their earthly journey here, but what is the outreach to young families? Uh, and it, you need to have people of every age. So we, uh, we do need to um, wrestle with, though, that over 65 population. The census is telling us that um, within 10 years. That's the fastest growing group. That's right. One of every five people in the United States will be over 65. That's, that's a radical shift from when I was a little girl. Including your bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably be right there with you. Um, so you can see from these numbers, you know, uh, we we have a special challenge within uh, religious education uh, and within our Catholic schools. Uh, you know, again, just like the size of the parishes are different, the size of the religious education programs are different. Yeah. Our biggest program is 1,700 students in religious education. And our smallest is less than 40. So what's the likelihood you can have a qualified professional uh, preparing and administrating a 40-person program <laughs> and how important is it to have a qualified professional for 1,700 students. Mm. Um, and when you see that number juxtaposed with the number of students in Catholic schools, we would obviously like to have many more Catholics uh, take advantage of the, um, the excellent education and the faith formation that happens just, within our Catholic schools. This is schools. just one of the examples of where the pressure comes even financially in a parish you know, right. to be able to hire somebody to be responsible and to do a competent job is, uh, is an expensive prospect yeah. for a parish. Sure Many is. of the parishes handle it with volunteers and they're wonderful and thank God for them. Uh, but some of them are so large uh, and even unwieldy, I would say, that the, the parish really needs to have uh, uh, someone who's a full-time uh, uh, person on the job. Mm -hmm. So we can see that the parishes are struggling. We have this issue with not being able to engage all age groups. We have this issue with facilities, some of which are inadequate for the needs of the parish. We have the issue of finances, as Tony talked about, with, some, with parishes unable to pay their own uh, bills. They're operating in deficits or perhaps have great 
debt to the diocese because they can't they can't um, meet their obligations. We know that in some cases staffing is inadequate because of. Um, of finances or even because of the change uh, in ethnicity and language. Uh, and so uh, all those are special challenges that we need to face in the future. Um, but chief among those challenges will be the number of priests that we have. Yeah. Uh, and right now in the diocese we have about 200 active priests who are ministering among our population. How many of um, those are diocesan? About 165, 166 I think are diocesan at this time. Uh, that means if we were to do the math, there's one priest in the diocese for about every 4,000 Catholics in the diocese. Uh, so you can see how essential um, their role is, how essential the role of um, retired priests are in helping us to meet the needs of the people. Um, but uh, one of our concern comes with the aging of our presbyterate as well. And so we know that within 10 years, um, 64 of those 166 men will be uh, 70 and eligible for retirement. And we hope many of them are well and can stay beyond that. Uh, but 64 retirements, the possibility of 64 retirements in the next 10 years, 44 of them pastors. So 44 of our 107 parishes, the pastors of 44 of our 107 parishes are eligible to retire in the next 10 years. It's a very special challenge. And, and that's why providing for them is a strain. Absolutely. We have to provide for these guys well into the future, and uh, priests are living longer, people are living longer, and so their medic medical care and all of that becomes an issue. And on the earlier side, getting these fellows into the seminary, giving them good training and good experience, expensive mm -hmm. proposition. That's right. And it's going to take really the best of our attention to meet the numbers that we are uh, hearing from our actuarial studies. You know, we have 166 uh, priests active right now. In ten, by 2025, the actuarial study is telling us we will have 125 priests in the diocese. And that's providing we continue our efforts to focus on vocations and offer uh, men who hear the call a chance to train at the seminary and keeping our priests healthy and, and all of that. So that, that's an optimistic number uh, that requires us to be really attentive to this, mm. um, this area. So, uh, you know, overall we can see that um, we do have a need to continue to decrease the number of pastorates here in the diocese. We can't close parishes to meet the number of priests we have. Uh, and so we have to um, be creative, I think, and be prayerful uh, in the way that we think about um, new models of pastoral leadership for parishes, uh, the uh, intentional um, assignment uh, of priests and the, the, uh, the um, use of their time in priestly ministry uh, as opposed to things that can be shared with other members of the faithful. Um, and the involvement of more Catholics uh, in the life and mission of the church. The lady, um, the faithful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we know that there are some models out there. Currently we have parishes with a resident pastor. Currently we have parishes that have been merged that have a resident pastor but two church buildings uh, where communities are worshiping. We have uh, places where there is uh, one pastor but there are two communities that are twinned together or linked in some way uh, and who are cooperating in ministry. Um, but the canon law provides for us two other options. Uh, one would be uh, to cluster parishes, to uh, select a neighborhood of parishes, if you will, and say that there will be a clergy team that will work with this whole neighborhood of parishes over time. They would live together in one place and they would work closely with um, with deacons and religious and with lay members uh, on a pastoral staff to minister to a number of parishes in an area. So it wouldn't just be two, it would be three or four uh, parishes in an area that would consider itself a neighborhood of parishes. They would all remain independent from one another, um, but they could also have a shared future. Um, 
Uh, and the last thing that canon law leaves up to you as the ordinary is the naming of lay pastoral administrators or deacons or religious. Yeah, we've but only done that once in my tenure. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a deacon. That's right. And it was for a short period of time. And the, the requirement of the law is you can do it as long as there's a priest moderator available. That's right. Because you still have to have mass and you still have to have... Uh, but even the law assumes that that's a temporary situation. Mm -hmm. But again, we know that the, the gifts of uh, all are to be brought to the sure, mission. Sure. Uh, and so uh, it's one of the tools that um, that the order of the church gives us to make sure that the mission of the church is um, is seen to. And, and so, Bishop, really, uh, in that meeting you spoke about with the Presbyteral Council, that's what led um, the planning office to make that proposal about some clustering of parishes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea of that would be that we would begin to identify five or six places around the diocese where we know that within three to five years there will only be a team of clergy for several parishes and begin to work with them now uh, to understand the ties of cooperation and collaboration between the parishes that would be necessary and engage them really in thinking about their future and how I'm going to start uh, discussing this with the presbyterate with the priests in the four counties this year in preparation for uh, uh, our uh, priest convocation next year uh, to look at some of these questions. I think in some cases we don't even know what the questions are to ask. That's right. And so we have to prepare uh, our priests to uh, to think this through with us and then the priests to go with their parishioners and to think it through with them so that they understand what's moving. I, I watched the uh, reaction in one of the local uh, or neighboring dioceses to the announcement of change and to listen to the people's comments. I mean, there were irrational comments and as though the, the diocese wanted to do this, is happy to make these changes. It isn't. If we could leave everything the way it is, it'd be great, but we can't. We know that, and yet the faith still has to be proclaimed, and so Absolutely. we've got to do the best we can to make this work. That's right. The realities of these circumstances with, you know, many people, many languages, fewer clergy, strain on the facilities, strain on the finances, those are all realities, but we cannot abdicate our responsibility to proclaim the Word of God. And, yeah. and, uh, so that's really what planning is about in the Diocese of Trenton. Good. Well, I appreciate very much, Terry. That was a very, very good full report, and I appreciate the work that your office does so well throughout the diocese. You're very helpful to our parishes. And so that brings our presentation, our formal presentation, to a close. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you have learned, as I have learned, much about the diocese in these moments together, and that this will be food for conversation within the pastoral councils in the parishes as well as the finance councils of the parishes. I think it's important for us in the diocese to share as much information as we can so that when we have opinions, the opinions are based on the truth and facts and not just some whim or flight of fancy. Thanks very much for your time and attention and God bless you. <laughs>